We move on to resorts, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Resorts World Genting, a much better place to be at than KL right now. <coughs> um, Dr. Nico Tan is the Vice President for Relationship Marketing of Resorts World Genting, Malaysia, in charge of digital marketing transformation and customer relationship and management. And also, with over two decades of digital exposure, uh, including e-advertising, speaking, and most importantly, real life in the trenches business experiences, he is here to tell us, see how? Two words that help us use and monetize big data. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice President of Technology, Adoption, and Monetization, Maven, Dr. Nikotan. Good morning. So in 2012, it was my first time in Malaysia. Obviously, I'm not Malaysian. Uh, I love Malaysia. I decided to stay here longer. Uh, Malaysia Bole. Uh, and the word Sihau was kind of like a, the, the first two words that I've learned in this, in this country. I find that your country very unique. It's, it's, a, it's a very inspiring country. And every time I get to talk to people, no matter who they are, whether a top CEO down to you know one of the staff, it's as if the way you guys talk is 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 a what? How do I put it in a nice word? Roja <laughs> uh, And and I heard I remember one day uh, I was in my office here uh, on my first visit. I saw two Malaysians. One was going in the lift, and then the other one was going out. And then they were waiting, right? And the other one, and the other, one guy said, "Hey, how are?" Then the other one said, see how? Then I said, no, like, wow, they understood each other. From my country, subject, verb, agreement matters, you know, like you have to complete your sentences. But here, apparently they understand each other, so there must be some other things that's happening, right? And the word see how, I realize, it's a pleasant way to decline an event invitation. Come now, see how, then you don't get offended. Okay, I'm prepared. I'm, I wash, you know, uh, prepare food for you, and then you're not going to come, right? Uh, and I realized that the word see how is actually a validation tool here as well. When you say see how, and you don't notice this, is that it's as if you are validating specific actions, which relates to my talk, right? Because when they gave me this topic, I'm like, how, do I, how am I going to make my topic interesting? If I'm going to talk about data every day, and you guys are familiar with data, I'm sure. So, why not tell you my story, right? So, all throughout, I'm not going to show you data, obviously. It's confidential. <laughs> you know, I cannot show you internal data. But I'm going to tell you the story how I managed to grow resourceful getting uh, revenue in the last four years without the theme park. Because the number one question everybody asks me is, when is it opening the outdoor theme park, right? Uh, and we all know, and we all know in the management team, we all know that the outdoor theme park is our key driver for growth. So what do you do when you're managing a product like Genting, where there is no new product to sell, and you have to market it to the existing customers over and over again? How do you monetize that? Obviously, database marketing, right? Go to your data, try to understand them better, right? So before we go to my case study, is it working? Okay, there you go. So I'll give you some information on, on what I think this big data event is happening. You know? well, why is data being talked about so frequently these days? Uh, nine out of ten marketing leaders believe that successful brands use data to drive business decisions. Marketing people who are here, do you believe this? Raise your hands. Marketing, you believe this, right? A lot of marketing people right now use fancy words like you know, data, algorithms, you know. Sometimes when I hear those words, I'm like, my nose bleeds like, wow, so technical. Huh? What do you mean? Algorithms. Such a big word, right? Can you talk to me in simplistic words now? You know? uh, so this is a marketer's perspective, right? When you talk to a CIO or any IT guy, right, they will say this. They believe that their organization don't understand how to use big data. So the marketing person says, yes, we are using it to drive business decisions. But the IT guy, no, no, you're not using it properly. You're not even capturing it. So there's, there's a big 
gap there between your IT folks and your marketing people. So how do you solve that gap, right? Uh, that's why I'm pretty sure a lot of you have been hearing about marketing tech, you know, marketing technology, tech stack, because that's a specific industry that has grown because of this need, right? There must be somebody who could understand marketing or business and IT. That's me for MT, so that's my role. I'm the bridge between my IT folks and my bosses, and, and I get to talk to the IT very technically, while when I talk to my bosses, I talk as simple as, you know, revenue, profit, make them understand. And I still remember pitching to my board where, you know, I condense a very complex report into one slide, and I just told them, this is how we make money. Ah, money, ah, people. No more talk, money. At the end of the day, all of us in the organizations must make money, right? That is our objective. Before we could help people out, help ourselves first, lah, right? Make profit, make money. So, a lot of people hate this. I always believe that you have to spend money to make money, right? Uh, and, 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 and that is the conundrum right now, right? So, having said that, 82% uh, of business leaders reported that they don't have a formal strategy to deal with big data. What is really the strategy around it, right? How do we use it? Is it a driver of the company? Or is it, you know, just an enabler? Oh, my best friend when I had golf the other day said they're using it, so I must use it as well. You know how these business owners are? Right? They gather together, you know, the Tansuris, the Dapusuri, they gather, they talk. One person says, ah, I'm using big data. The person's ego said, I'm using it too. Then they go back and say, hey, CEO, better make sure we use big data. <laughs> Next week, in the uh, Expo, uh, Expo, please talk about it. I want a strategy around it. Then the CEO scratches his head, pass it down to the CEO, CEO pass it down to the CEO. They all look at each other in the board and say, what are we gonna present that? Right? You're laughing because it's true, right? <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I know it's true because that's my experience, right? So, the recent research shows that executives complain that data science doesn't provide the guidance they hope for. This is the latest we saw. Everybody keeps talking about data, but actually the business leaders keep saying, hey, it's not really providing me the result, the value that I'm looking for. You know, is it revenue? Is it profit? Is it optimization of work? Is it creating a new culture? I don't know. I don't know how to measure it. I do not understand it. And what's worse is that when they survey the data scientists, 90% of them thinks that the business leaders don't know how to ask the right questions. And then the business leader says, no, you don't give me the right answers. So who's which is which? And, and I'm pretty sure throughout the day or until tomorrow, one of the speakers will say one of the reasons why a data scientist uh, is failing right now is really because of communication skills. They're not being measured based on their technical skills, they're being measured on their ability to communicate. Why is that important? Because at the end of the day, and whoever is the data scientist here, I'm telling you now, practice this. It is important. Why? No matter how smart you are, even if you are the next Einstein, if I cannot understand you, I will not give you my money. How am I going to give you my money if I don't understand you, right? There's a reason why business leaders are business leaders. They know how to negotiate. They know how to use simplistic words. Because at the end of the day, in their heads, it's about creating value, that people who want to buy and send it over. I don't know about your clustering methodology, you know, your Python and your R. I, I, I don't care. My boss says to me, I don't care how much growth, incremental growth, you can give me, right? So, if you have two sides fighting each other, then the question is, how do you make money then? Like, simplistically, how do we make money? You know, ask yourself, don't think technical, you know. Which part of my data can I monetize or could, that I could convert into something valuable that people would want to, would want to pay for, right? And, and I remember, before I proceed, I remember my talk, one of the CEO of one of the big companies here who consults with me, you know, he, he, he called me one day and said, uh, Nico, uh, can we have a talk? I followed your advice. I actually hired two data scientists in my company. I'm like, fantastic. So, what do you tell them when you have meetings, when they present to you? You know what he said? He said, he laughed, and I have, don't know, I don't understand them, you know. <laughs> so I said, 
you know that they're freaking expensive, ah? I said, yeah, that's why I'm so afraid that I have to lose them. <laughs> because I know they have value, I just don't know how to make use of them, right? So, so then there's this missing gap. If there's a data scientist and there's the business leader, there must be somebody that's able to explain the work of a data scientist. Um, SAS, uh, I talked to the managing director of SAS, we had a meeting the other day, we were just bouncing off ideas. And he was asking, Nico, you know, what do you think uh, your company's heading to and how can we help you? And then I asked him, I threw it back. Well, the question is, how are you helping Malaysia? How are you helping them build the skill set? Because no matter what I do, right, there is that gap that we are missing out. It's not data scientists, actually. It's data analysts, business analysts. Do we have a course for that? Are you working with the universities with that? Because no matter how the data scientists, you know what they, what is, what's important to a data scientist? Modeling, creating, you know, getting data, models, predicting, put them in a room, right? They, you know, majority of the data scientists I know are introverts. They don't want to present, right? They're very smart. And my data scientist actually is a, is a Nigerian guy. Uh, so smart, he talks. I look at him, I stare at him, I'm like, in my head, I'm playing some sort of a movie until he finishes, and then, okay, great, good job, I'll see something like that. So how do we do that? Don't tell me data scientists, right? <laughs> so I'll give you a, a case study. After showing you the stats, I'll tell you how we did it in my company, right? And I'll tell you the story of the scientist and the pragmatist. I'll tell you the characters of my story. First is Dr. Yunus Saadi, he's the Algerian. I hired him about two years ago, and he has been applying data science or machine learning in my company. He has a PhD in machine learning, hardcore PhD in machine learning. He has worked for the academy. He's actually from the academy, he was a research fellow. And then when I talked to him, I told him, uh, don't you want to work for the corporate? And then he said, corporate doesn't really give me excitement. And I told him, let's try to exchange value. You work for me, help me build some of the models that I wanted to do. Uh, in exchange, you could publish anything you want under your name in all the journals. His eyes were like, okay, I'm joining, right? So, I'll tell you about the other person. This is Esti San, one of my staff. She's 10 years doing product development. She's a fantastic lady, smart, logical, and very uh, practical, right? And she's been doing the product development for Gintin, right? So, I know it's a bit uh, lengthy. There are two issues here. We do not work together in the beginning, but Esti is the one who's making sure that we send out our monthly offers, free rooms lah, to our customers. So they come up, they spend in the resort, then they come down. My KPI right now is, I, Resourceful Genting has 10,000 rooms. We, have, we are still the, the world title holder for the world's largest hotel. My KPI is to fill that room every day. Any hotel, if there's a hotel here, I'm pretty sure they're gonna tell you, an average occupancy of a hotel in a year would roughly 60, 70, 80 percent, you're doing good. I'm doing 98 percent on average, right? Uh, thank you very much, but my bosses wanted 100, you know, <laughs> impossible to. And then these bosses are, show you 98 percent, they say, I want 100, you know my response? I sacrifice a chicken so that we hit 100. Pray to God, sacrifice a chicken, maybe we hit 100. I've done everything that I can, right? So, and then Eunice's issue was that because nobody understood him in the beginning, there was no support. There were no projects being given to him. So I had to get them together and said, what if he creates models for SP? Because SP doesn't know how to make more money from what she's doing. All she knows is that gut tells her, gut feel tells her that this is the way to do things. But with data, and she has over about 20 years of data. That's what I love about Genting, because it's a casino company. And you go to any casino companies in the world, it has the richest data because we capture every data point. Even me, I'm, like, I'm amazed we build our own data servers, data warehouses. Uh, it, it's, it's really controlled. And the amount of information we get from every single transaction is captured. Even facial technology, you know? Cameras around, it has to be covered. You go to Macau, they're even far more advanced. And that makes my job interesting because Genting is not just casino, it's an integrated resort. We have FNB, we have theme park, we have transportation. So imagine all the transactional data in 20 years' time, how much information we could analyze and the behavior. So before they work together, this is the share of total business, 12% by department, right? 12% of the overall Genting uh, efforts. 
So in that 98%, 12% of that is mine. In our revenue, that's roughly around, uh, how much is that? Last year, we made, uh, 2015, we made about 8 billion ringgit uh, revenue. So 12% of that is my department's contribution, right? Uh, so we combine their expertise, you know, I told them SDE, everything that you know. Give it UNES, be a scientist and approach it, right? And we created our very first proprietary customer algorithm for profit maximization. And this is the model. It's confidential. I know you're going to take pictures, but uh, you can, you can. It's okay. Because I strip this down. I run through my boss 10 times and say, he keeps, remove this, remove this. I'm like, okay, nah. but I need to give them something, right? So I call it my man machine product development cycle using machine learning. First, we ask ourselves, by the way, the dark blue colors are manual. You cannot move away from that. There must be people running this, right? It, must, it cannot be fully automated. Ma maximization, first step, we ask ourselves, what do we want to do with the business question that you're asking? Do you want to maximize it or minimize it? Maximize profit, minimize cost. Basic, right? Uh, then if we craft out the right hypothesis or the right business question, then we give it to this tool that we created. It does three things. It generates the data, the algorithm, it cleanses it, and then it processes it at scale, petabyte level, right? Uh, in our case, we have about 4 million customers, uh, and with all the data points, it's a lot, right? And then after the system uh, processes it, then there's this tool that we use, part of that algorithm, the model, uh, to do anal analysis. So it will immediately size the opportunity, create a profitability or margin type of model, like are we going to make money? At the end of the day, we must make money for this, right? And then clustering. Our approach for machine learning is the basic clustering model, K, K means. Uh, if you understand that, that's the most basic clustering model you can have. Uh, pros and cons, right? I'm trying to move away from it because there's a lot of, I realized in the last four years, although it made us money, uh, there's still a lot of operational issues that you will face when you apply that. Because the problem with a K means clustering is that what is K? How many clusters was defining the clusters? You could have 100, 1,000. Uh, and then in the end, then that I ended up with 72 clusters. Imagine 72 clusters creating different offers micro level. That's a lot, combining all our products and services. After that, it goes back to a human person, which I have a team. They will then discuss. With this insight, let's develop the product. Let's do prototype, test it out, does it make sense? Then put it back in the system in my marketing automation tool to launch it, and it's real time optimization. The feedback, when people are consuming the product, it optimizes it in time, it feeds it back to the original state. Then it spurts out another system and say, hey, predictive model, right? There's a prediction, then we, we change our operations. So that's how we cycle it, simplistically, that it is. But if you look at how we operate in the resort, my team, they're just stuck in a room. They do this like in a month's time. It consumes almost two weeks of their time, just to Turn out. And then we wanted to do 12 months in advance because uh, our business is travel. It's like AirAsia, right? You sell 12 months in advance. Uh, so in order for us to get our business in. So after doing that, from 12, I'm now 58%. I'm majority share of the company. So therefore, thank you very much. That, this is something I'm proud of because it made me uh, more job security. Imagine going to a board and tell your boss, you want to change something, then better find a way to get 58%, right? At scale. And you know how many people do I have in this department, this small team? 20 people. Genting has 14,000 employees, both front end, back end, you know, uh, frontliner and, and back of the house. But uh, I only have 20 people just for this team doing all the 58%. But of course, everybody helped, obviously. Every stakeholder helped. Uh, but the thinking starts from this guy. This is the brain, actually, that developed uh, the company. Uh, even my team, they are required to attend every single meeting because without them, how are we going to target customers? How are we going to attract them to come out? Right? My business is not online. They have to be in the resort to spend money. So it's a very physical business. And what were my lessons when I did all of this? And I'll share with you what my, 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 my lessons are. First. To avoid processing dirty data, start with what you know. The problem with every data person is that just because there's a lot of data, it doesn't mean you need to use all of them. 
you need to partner with someone who knows what's going on. And you start with what you know. Don't start with what you don't know. Normally, we assume things, right? It's going to be like this. That's dangerous already. Do not assume. What do you know? What are facts? Facts you cannot debate. But I tell you, facts are not reality. Lah, right? Makes sense, right? You present facts, but based on your reality and your experience, that is your reality. It's not the real thing. That's why when I say what you know, you ask people around. You ask all the people who have experienced the problem, have the experience, to, to make sure that you have captured the information so that when you ask a priori hypothesis, priori hypothesis is your initial hypothesis. What is the business problem? What is the problem statement? You must define it clearly. I always believe there are no wrong answers, but there's such a thing as wrong questions, right? Ask the wrong questions, get the wrong answers. Garbage in, garbage out. Stupid questions, stupid answer, right? So, number two would be generate quality data, not quantity. Uh, understand how your data is generated. That's it. That's, this is actually what it means. When we say quality, it actually means, do you know how it's being captured? Is it capturing the right variables, the right information? Uh, marketing variables are a bit more complex because it's not one-to-one, -one, it's not transaction. You'll say something like perception. How do you measure perception, right? It's a combination of data. But when you talk about simplistically business KPIs, a transaction is a transaction, but better make sure you are capturing it properly because if not, your analysis is going to go wrong. Number three, let the data speak for itself through visualization rather than selectively choose the data to support personal biases. We have biases. Especially when you do the projects, you get defensive, right? When somebody questions your projects. No, no, you're wrong. I know this project so well. You, you put up those force fields because you have spent blood, sweat, and tears building that project, right? But the problem is that you are overwhelmed with your own personal biases, which makes the project fail. So if you are the leader of your organization, please practice visualization. There's a lot of it, Tableau, uh, Datorama, uh, SAS, Visual Machine Learning, and in all of these items, you just put in the data and visualize it. And even without you knowing how to do it, the fact that these softwares will visualize for you, you can see a pattern. Uh, if any one of you is a PhD here, you'll understand this. And if you're planning to take a PhD, the first thing they will teach you in analysis, descriptive statistics. Put it all, show it in the data. Do you see any pattern? Because data numbers cannot give you patterns unless you are very smart, like Einstein, or you know, you can see patterns in data. But graphically, you could see it. Is it going up, going down? Try to combine data, maybe you'll see some relevances. Then you hire a very smart statistician to tell you if there's correlation or not, statistically significant, right? Second to the last, experience trumps automated systems. If the generated data is still good to be true, it probably is. What I mean by this is that even though the data gives you, please practice your experience. Does it make sense? You know what I learned from my president in Genting? I like what I like. He's very smart and very practical. He asked the most practical questions of all. I show him a lot of graphs, visuals, and then he just asked me this question. Nico, uh, when you say something like this, do you see it on the floor? I'm like, what do you mean do you see? Have you been to our floor, our mall, our casino, our theme park? Did you go there and see it for yourself? Is it happening? I was shocked. I'm like, oh, but the data, I'm not asking data. Did you see it? Because seeing is believing, right? I said, no. He said, before I believe this, go there and see it for yourself. Because if it's not happening, maybe your data is wrong. True enough, when I went there, it is wrong. <laughs> His gut is telling him, that gut, if you read any science, gut actually is not just gut feel. It comes from a muscle memory behind your brain. There's a science to it. That's why he's overreacting like that, because of his wisdom and experience, right? So do not reject that. Even though you do not under understand data science, please practice your practicality and experience and tell the data science, this is what's happening on floor. Please look at your models, right? And improve it. Lastly, experiment, experiment, experiment. Introduce testing methodologies in each result to validate effectiveness and predict success. The good thing about data science is you can test it out, right? Don't go big, have a small, you can have many models, you can have a small A-B testing, or in my case, I cannot do A-B testing because I don't have time, I need to make money. So what I did is what we call champion challenger. So I split every cluster, I split it in half. Whatever is the winning product, I create a competing product and launch it half. And then it's at scale. 
whatever is that, and we have some formula around it, whatever wins, overtakes as the winning product next month. And that is automated, right? So that's about it. I hope you managed to learn from my story. And I don't know if I have more questions. Yes. So uh, lastly, guys, please do come up. No haze up there. I just went last week. Very good. Very good. Very good, especially and for those of you asking about theme park. Yes. I cannot say it's confidential. Ah, oh, that was my next question. Thank you very much, Dr. Nico. A big round of applause. <laughs>